Oh, all right. Hi, everybody. I'm Artith Wary. I live on third floor north. I began quilting as a distraction. I'd done macrame, I'd done quilling, I'd done, you know, embroidery, and I thought, well, wonder if I would enjoy quilting. So it was not to learn anything specific. It was just for a distraction. Well, I got into quilting and found out there was so much to learn and so many interesting things. And then I found this book. This book, Barbara Brackman took the time and the effort to collect from all around the country quilt patterns and to verify where they were from, what they were called, what they were named. And as I looked through this, I saw a lot of pattern names that had to do with American history. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to just pull out the ones I know and see what I have? And I decided it was a pretty good talk. And so you're going to review American history through quilt patterns. It's not going to be a study of the American quills, per se, because that's a different topic altogether. But it's reviewing American history through, through quilt, quilt patterns, and they all came from here. Quilt patterns, quilt patterns could be the same thing in different regions and have different names. It could be the same pattern in a different decade and have a different name. So even though it might be a quilt pattern that you know by Rob Peter to Pay Paul, it might be called something else 10, to, 10 years later. So this, this I found interesting too. So, but we're going to review American history. We're going to start with the oak leaf pattern. And this starts before America was formed. In the 1600s, the King of England would issue charters, and a charter was a legal document that gave a group of people some rights and privileges. And the King of England would give charters to groups of industrials, um, and he, let's see, he called them uh, well-loving, well, well well-disposed subjects. He would give some charters to them, and they came over, and, and many of you are familiar with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Well, they, they had received a charter. Philadelphia, they had received a charter. And in 1661, a group of people decided they wanted a charter for Connecticut. They were denied, so they went back, they reworked it, and they went back the next year, and the king granted them the charter this time. Well, that king left, and they went to Connecticut. And some of these were business enterprises, and some were not. They left, uh, that, that king left. The next king came along, and he decided he want, wanted to revoke all of the charters. He sent Edmund Adros over to collect all the charters. And he went around to each colony and said, I want your charter. Well, the people in Connecticut weren't so happy about that. Now picture this. We don't have electricity, right? Edmund arrived when it got dark, walked into the log cabin, the candles were lit, the charter was on the table at the far end, and as he's walking up to get it, this is a documented story, as he's walking up to get it, the light goes out. Ooh. And when the candle is relit, there is no charter on the table. They had taken it out the back window and they had hidden it in an oak tree. No, we don't know where it is. Hmm. So he had to go back home without that charter. Well, later on, next king came along and he, he, he changed all of that rule. So the Connecticut group reassembled, voted on a governor, and you know what? They found a charter and it was in this oak tree. And so thus we have a pattern. Quilters would create a pattern to remember something. And this is, this is the oak leaf pattern. That tree, now this was in the 16, 18, 1660s, that tree survived until 1865. Isn't that amazing? So anyway, that's our first one. The next one.
This one's called Burgoyne Surrounded. This is in the Revolutionary Day period. And the reason I have a map up here is I want to show you where some of these events happened. Of course, here's Connecticut right down here. But this one is Burgoyne Surrounded. Burgoyne was sent over by the king to squelch those rebellious colonists. And he started out from Canada, and he came down this way with about five to 6,000 troops. Uh, not just English people, but Germans helped with it, and there were some uh, French with it, and some Indians. And he expected that as he came down the valley that he would collect more troops and more people would help him along the way. He, and he would find provisions. Beside the five to 6,000 troops, they had about 1,000, they called them hangers on, but they would be teamsters, people who would help, and just lady friends. And, and so the plan was that he would come down this way from Canada. Laguerre was supposed to come up from New York City, but he didn't. He decided he wanted to go fight over in Pennsylvania. And then, um, I have to get his name. I know you want to know the names, right? Where's my glasses? And I, I'm not a good Frenchman, so I don't say all of these names right. Okay. And so the other, the other person was to come over from here. He was, he was starting from here, and he was to go over here. And they were going to do a pincher movement, and they were going to sort of divide the colonists. And that's a great plan. That's a good strategic plan. However, he didn't go there. He went to Pennsylvania. He didn't go there. He went up to here. And Burgoyne did not know that he was alone. He got down as far as Saratoga. And he decided to stop for a little bit. He was running out of provisions. He had not picked up more help. And they, they needed to stop, get provisions. And so he stopped for about three weeks. Well, those three weeks really gave the colonists time because they were only 1,500 people. But they swelled their ranks from 1,500 to about 3,000. And so when... And then, then in August, he decided he wanted to, I'm looking at the wrong note. He, in August, he decided he'd send out a few and find out what the lay of the land was. Well, these, these 3,000 people forced and defeated the 1,000 that were sent out to find out what was going on. I cannot imagine, in my, I, I have a hard time in my mind thinking of that many people walking through and not just ruining the whole countryside. But I guess that's what they did. So anyway, they, went, they retreated, they went back, and they gave him the bad, sad news. So he did have a skirmish or two, but by October, he had started in April, and here it is October, and by October, the colonists had won, and he surrendered to General Schuyler. Things were different in those days than they are now. When he surrendered to General Schuyler, General Schuyler said, why don't you just stay at my place until you go home? Yeah. And so this General, General Burgoyne stayed at Schuyler's home until he was able to go back home. Of course, he went home uh, in a defeat because he was, the first, he was the first British general who had been defeated on foreign soil. So he, he got a bad name when he went home. Uh, now, there were three battles. It wasn't just Saratoga, but it was Bemis Heights and Freeman's Farm. And they say that those three battles encouraged the French to come participate and help. By hearing about the win of those three battles, that helped encourage the French to come and enter and help us. And that was interesting to know. But this is called Burgoyne Surrounded. I know of no other quilt pattern that honors somebody that surrendered. But isn't it a beautiful two-colored quilt? And what I found was the quilts that are redone, it's either, the it's either for the reason it was made or it's for 
the plainness, the, the beauty of a two-color, something along that line, or the intricacy of it. And that's what I, and so this one was redone more than one time. Then we have, there was, there was a Frenchman named Lafayette. His full name includes seven names. So I'll just say Lafayette. Lafayette was a, born of a French aristocratic family and he wanted to become known as, as a great soldier. So he was looking for somewhere that he could be of service, that he could, be, could get a name for himself. And when he was about 27 years old, he came over to uh, Pennsylvania, met Washington, they became friends, and the colonists said, we'll make you a general. And so they, he became a general, he led divisions of, of troops, he would win his battles, and then by 1780, I think it was, let me see, 1707, okay, he, he fought with distinction at the Battle of Brandywine in Pennsylvania in seven, 1777, and then they, they made him a division commander. So he returned to France early 1779, and he helped persuade the French to enter the, the war. So with him going home and saying, this is a good thing, and having one up here, it was the French decided that they'd send about 6,000 troops and a fleet. And so they helped us quite a bit. So he came back to America in 1780. He commanded an army in Virginia, and he forced the British commander, Lord Charles Cornwallis, to retreat across Virginia. And then at Yorktown, he was entrapped in late July. And the Battle of Yorktown essentially was the end of the war. And so the, he returned to France and was called the hero of two worlds. He liked that. And so then he came back for a visit and he, was, he was, um, became the citizen of several of the states. And he had some triumphal gatherings, and there was one in Philadelphia. And at the banquet, part of the dessert was an orange. He took out his knife, and he carved it into four equal pieces and opened and peeled it that way. A young girl in the audience said, may I have those for a souvenir? And thus became the orange peel. And that's when she created that. I thought it would be fun to make a whole quilt of this. Oh, it's hard. It's hard to make all of these pieces come together just right. So I, I cobbled this together. Um, not a good job. But you know what? From the back of a trotting horse, you can't tell the difference. But for two reasons, this became a, a nice one. One, because of the beauty of it. Isn't it great? I mean, just those two colors, whatever two colors the ladies chose, it's a beautiful design. And the fact that it, they were thinking of Lafayette and they were so pleased with Lafayette. So, the, so then we have the orange peel. It's also called Rob Peter to Pay Paul and it's also called the Melon Patch. Then we move along in time. And we, you know, besides the Democratic and Republican Party, at one time they had what? The Whig Rose Party. And there's the Whig Rose. And the Whig Rose, it, uh, the original colors were yellow, red, maroon, blue, and green. Now, in 1840, there's evidence that the women felt strongly about the 1840 election, and they were now encouraged to participate and be verbal about it. Until then, they weren't to say anything. So the 1840s, there were all kinds of political issues, and they inspired quilt, dine, quilt designs left and right. This one, one of the persons who wanted to be uh, one of the candidates was Henry Clay. Henry Clay was, has been noted 
as the great pacifier or the great compromiser because when he was in the Senate, he encouraged them to compromise on how many slave states and how many free states. He had them compromise on the financial issues. He was, he was always a great compromiser. And he really wanted to be the Whig presidential candidate, but he wasn't. And it's because he had, he didn't really, uh, he really felt the slaves should be free, but he wouldn't keep quiet about it. And he really felt like the fin finances needed to be different, but he wouldn't keep quiet about it. And they said, if you just tone down your rhetoric, you know, we, we really would like you to be our presidential candidate. And he said, no, I'd rather be right than be president. And so then this is called Clay's Choice. And as far as I know, that's the only name that's ever been given to this pattern. Clay's Choice. Oh, and incidental, this fabric is a, is a duplicate of some revolutionary material. I bought a bit of that when I was out east one year and, and used it sparingly, but that, that was, those are the colors and those are, that's the pattern. But Clay's choice, I'd rather be right than be president. So what he decided to do was he would remain a senator and try to influence the decision of the president. And remember who ran for president in the 1840s was uh, William Harrison. Uh, but he didn't, he only lived about one month after his inauguration, so Tyler became the president. But Harrison, Harrison was uh, the presidential candidate. And of course, they were all anti-Jackson, strict financial imposition. And so that was one thing that the Whig party ran on. And, and then they asked, for, they asked for Tyler to be their, their president, vice presidential can, candidate because he would get the vote of the southern states. And besides that, he had been sent up to Tippecanoe in Indiana to put down mm, those Indians who were starting to get along together and they were going to pull themselves together and fight together and get rid of the colonists. Oh, we can't have that. So Tyler was sent to put down that, re that, that insurrection. And so they say that both sides kind of went back and forth. There was no definite win. The Indians ended up going toward Canada, and so he was declared, he declared himself the winner. And that was at Tippecanoe. So how did they win? They had innocuous slogans. They didn't talk about the issues. And then they had wonderful slogans. Remember the one that comes from that time? Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And that's the slogan that won them the presidential candidate. So here's Tippecanoe. This is one version of Tippecanoe, and of course you know it as the Ohio Star and lots of other names. But this is one, this, this is Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe and Tyler too, and they, and they won the contest. Now we go to I'm trying to keep this somewhat short. Um, oh, well, we weren't, we didn't have a definite boundary yet. The United States didn't, so there is a, where do we end up here? Where do we end up there? Well, in 1884, or 1844, there was dissension, of course, with Mexico. Where, where are we going to have the boundary? And Mexico, Mexico wanted it along this river right here. And we wanted it along this river right here. All right? So the president said, I'm going to declare war, and I want you to go down there, and I want you to get rid of him. So they had, the war was from 1846 of April to February of 1848. And in 1845 is when we said, this is going to be ours. And they said, no, no, no. The war in which the U.S. forces were consistently victorious resulted in 
the U.S. acquisition of, do you know how much? When I was growing up, I didn't realize how much that was. Acquisition of all of that, right? That's a lot of territory, isn't it? All of that, all of that. So they went down to negotiate first, and then they said no, and the Mexican troops crossed the Rio Grande, and then, there, and then they said war is on, and they pushed them back, and they got that. So there were a lot of Mexican roses created, and I thought this one was an interesting one, so I copied this one. Found all of these in this book. This is a Mexican rose, which I thought was an interesting one. It's an unusual one. Yeah. Then, okay, so that takes care of the boundary to the south. What about the boundary to the north? Since 1823, the U.S. and in England had sort of just shared the boundary. But now it was time to make a decision on the boundary. And Britain said they wanted it to be the 49th parallel and come over and come down this way and go there. And we said, no, no, no. We want it to be 54, 40, or fight. And 54, this is the 49th parallel. You know where 54 is? Way up there. So 54, 40, or fight. So it was finally decided in the Treaty of 1846 that it would be the 49th parallel, and it would come over to between the between mainland and the island of Vancouver, down the middle, through the strait, and out to the Pacific, with both countries able to use those waters. And I think that's probably why cruises always start in Vancouver. There's some kind of an arrangement there. So that's part of that, too. So this block, where is this, has no other name. Oh, it's on here. This block has no other name, and it's this middle one right here, 5440 for, or fight. And you will see this block in lots and lots of quilts. It's an interesting block. But you will see a lot of the 5440 or fight. No other name for that block. OK. Then, in 1843, the first wagon train went over to Oregon and California. And of course, the wagon trains always started from here. They'd begin about in April, and they would, it would take them until December to get over to here. Now, the first wagon trains, it was primitive territory. Um, there was plenty of food, dangerous crossings, no guides, no, no, no guide. To buy and, and the leaders, very few leaders had ever been out there. But they had plentiful food and the Indians were fairly peaceful. They, so that was the first 10 years. But after that, it got a little, little hairier. Um, and they said this was probably one of the fewest, first huge migrations that had, had occurred. And they feel that, that uh, uh, a quarter of a million people probably went out there at that time. And I don't know that I could walk to California. That's a long walk. <laughs> so, uh, but these were upwardly mobile, mobile people, and they, they were coming from free land, and they were looking for free land. And, that t and this, this pattern, oh, and I need to show you the pattern, don't I? Okay, the pattern. This is one of them. Now, you know this is Drunkard's Path. But set this way, it's called Road to California. OK, Solomon's Puzzle, Chain Links, Rocky Road to Dublin, Rocky Road to California, or Robbing Peter to Pay Paul. So it depends on where you are in history as to what it's called. But this, is, this has been verified. Inter the way she uh, documents it, is to find the actual catalogs of like 1823 
And she found these actual catalogs where they would offer these patterns for sale. And, and she just accumulated all of this information. Um, all right. Now we're going to go to Civil War days. And if you were a quilt fan, I would show you. Here's another one of it, but you should never use two fabrics of the same of the same value because you don't see the pattern. During the Revolutionary War, oh, Nathan, I want to show them the book, all right? I forgot to do that. If you would like to read more about Burgoyne Surrounded in that time, there's an, there's an uh, archaeologist who went there, David Starbuck, and he has compiled information about that. If you'd like to read more about it, you're welcome to borrow, borrow this book from me and read lots more in detail about this time of period. Thanks, Nathan. And then, uh, Frederick, Maryland, that would be, oh, Maryland. <laughs> Where is Maryland? Right here. Frederick would be about here, about right there. During the war, Stonewall Jackson took his troops through Frederick, Maryland. And there's a reason I want to show you this one. Most of these are about events. This is, well, this is an event also, but it's about a particular person. This is called Barbara Fritchie. Barbara Fritchie was a real person, and, and when her, the troops were coming through, she took the flag, went up to the attic, and waved it out the window all the time he was going by and dared them to take it from her. Well, he didn't. And what happened is, like maybe a year or two after this event, John, someone took John, John um, Greenleaf Whittier, the poet, through and told him about the story of what had happened about this lady. She is a lady who married a glove, uh, glove maker, and they had li and they lived in Frederick, Maryland and told him about the event. And John Greenleaf Whittier wrote a poem, 30 couplets long, about the, about the, the event. And uh, remember way back when students were expected to memorize things, they had memorized Paul Revere's ride. Well, this couplet, these couplets were another thing that they were supposed to memorize when um, Churchill came over and visited the house in Maryland. They say that he stood there and he recited that poem by heart. And here's part of it. Shoot if you must this old gray head, but spare your country's flag, she said. A shade of sadness, a blush of shame over the face of the leader came. The nobler nature with him stirred to life at the woman's deed and word. Who touches the hair of yon gray head dies like a dog. March on, he said. Well, there's more to it, but I just thought that was great. So I, this is to tell you, this was a 90-year-old woman, and I share this with you today because if you're not yet 90, just think, you could do something for which you will be memorialized. Not only a quilt block, but a poem. You could do that. Don't give up. Anyway, that... That, that, was, that was pretty interesting. Uh, there are, of course, they have blocks for Washington and Lincoln and all of those people, but for somebody like Barbara Fritchie, you know, that, that was pretty special. Yeah, it was very special. Um, we have, during the war, things were getting pretty bad. And over here, near Kansas City, this was a slave state, this was a free state. Now, can you picture this at dead of night? Come on over, come be free. 
I'll help you escape. And then the next day, I'm coming back in to get my slaves. So a lot of things, there was a lot of disruption over here. But at that time, there were also, it was a perfect excuse for people who liked to fight, to fight. And let me remind you of a couple of them. There was Quantrill, and he did that horrible massacre in Lawrence. Um, 500 people came riding through, and they killed all 150 men and anybody old enough to hold a rifle, and then they burned the town. That was Quantrill. Jim Crow, an unsavory person, he was subject to violent fits of anger. He was very dangerous, and at the onset of the war, he started out with Quantrill and Bloody Bill Anderson. He enjoyed killing and exhibited traits of the most inhuman savage. Then there was James Jim Henry Lane, tall, gaunt, always disheveled, had a raspy voice. He was one of the first two senators in Kansas. In Missouri, they knew him as the freedom soldier. He freed you of your silverware. He freed you of your, your clothing. He freed you of anything. So he was known as the freedom soldier. Well, then there's the infamous order number 11. Things got really bad, and there was a lot, a lot of guerrilla warfare. And so, so Gen Brigadier General Thomas Ewing decided that he was going to deny the guerrillas of anything that they could use. So what he did is he ordered evacuation of about 20 miles around. You may take one wagon load, I want you to leave within 10 days, take one leg wagon load and go. And they said over 20,000 people were displaced. And after those 20,000 people left, he went through and he burned the buildings and he burned the food. He burned anything that could be of help to the guerrillas. And that would be like saying you live in Bella Vista and you'd have to move at least as far as Fayetteville, if not further, Fort Smith, and never go back. Well, while this is happening, you, now some of the soldiers would have been polite about it, but some of the soldiers would have been, oh, I get a chance to really take advantage and mess things up. And some of them did. And there was a 10-year-old named Francis, Fran, Fanny, Fanny Krieger Holler was 10 year old. She saw her mother's choice new quilt snatched from their bed by the marauders. And she said, I'm going to reproduce that quilt for my mother. And she did. And that's this pattern right here. And therefore it's called order number 11. Now there was, there was um, an artist who was also part of the Union Army. And when the war was done, he painted a picture of this event. You can see it in Kansas City. And what it shows is it shows a person on horseback kind of snatching the quilt and stomping on it, you know, just ruining it. And I don't know about you, I don't know how much sewing you've done, but if I had spent night after night after my chores were done, sewing a few stitches at a time, taking years to complete a quilt, and then see somebody do that, it would crush my spirits. It would really hurt. Anyway. Fanny said she was going to reproduce that for her mom, and she did. Aren't these great stories that, that you know, end up? Uh, then we have, so that's, that's order number 11. It's also called hip relief. I don't know why, but that's, that's the name for it. Both. I mean, you know, both. You know, whoever decided they wanted to be mean. <laughs> yeah, they were both. The marauders were on both sides. They were. Uh, and if you would read Truman's history, his, auto, his about his life, there's a chapter in there about about this incident. Yes, yeah. That's that's where I got that information from. Um, of course, this comes from that that same era, uh, the log cabin. This this pattern arrived on the scene in 1863. 
If you were, if Sue, someone asked you to date a quilt and you saw this pattern earlier and they said it's an earlier quilt, you'd say no, no, it's not. Because this pattern wasn't on the scene until 1863. Okay, and so it came, came about in Lincoln's presidential campaign. This represents the hearth, this represents the house. Some places you would see the yellow and that would represent the candles in the window and that. And some, you would see some of these with a the black in the middle. And that's supposed to represent the Underground Railroad. Now some of you have read a story about the Underground, about the quilts showing the way to Canada. Nah. I've read the book. There are too many discrepancies in it. There are some pattern names mentioned in there that did not occur until well after this time period. And think about it. When did they, when did they move? They moved at night, right? Is anyone going to leave their quilt on the fence in the middle of the night? No, they're not. They're just, it's a nice story, and I, I don't know the author personally. It's a nice story, but I would not take, I would take that as a legend. So quilts did not show the way to Canada. But during that time, there was the Underground Railroad, where they say about 60,000 slaves found their way north, and there were 14 states that participated in the escape route. And so, yes, they found their way, and they used, they called it the Underground Railroad because they used railroad terms in order to designate who was helping them. And that's why that was called. Now, during, during Lincoln's term, a lot of wreaths were made. Many, many wreaths were created. But when Lincoln was assassinated, this particular wreath became known as the President's Wreath. It's very pretty, isn't it? This one became known as the President's Wreath. And many quilters later on made more of this President's Wreath. This is 1865. Okay. Then I'm skipping clear on through. Oh, I didn't show, I didn't show. There was one more road to California. It's sometimes called Jacob's Ladder. This one. This one has several names. This one can be known as, as Road to California. Road to Oregon, Road to California. There were others that were roads too somewhere. But that, I, I learned it as Jacob's Ladder. It could be both, couldn't it? All right, what am I forgetting, nothing? Oh, during the Civil War, Nathan, I'm ready for a picture of the housewife. We found that both North, Northern and Southern soldiers not only had to equip themselves, you know, dress themselves, but they often had to take care of themselves. And they were sent from home in this. This is a, called a housewife. And it would be their, their sewing kit. And we found, we found evidence of many of them. They're about nine by four. And in it, you would have the thread. You'd have the needles and the pins. And, you know, whatever else mom decided to send along. And we have found in some of these, which is interesting, that there had been a message. And this lady was thanking the person for going to war in place of her son so that her son could stay home. So there must have been a lot of touching things that were sent along in this housewife. They call it a housewife. Yeah. So I made a, a copy of that. Yeah. The ones that survived, I'm just surprised that any survived, I, I, uh, but several have survived. Then I'm moving ahead, and here we are in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, uh, there was a land rush of 1889. Settlers from all over the world seeking free land traveled to the prairies to stake their claims. 
and one of the rules in claiming a parcel of land was that all participants were to line up and start running at the same time on the boom of a cannon, hence the name Boomers. And here are the Boomers. And every once in a while, I love, I love this one. Every once in a while, someone will, you'll see this in somebody's. Isn't that a nice one? Those are the Boomers. Those are the Boomers. I can see that for a kid's room, can't you? Perfect. The Boomers. It's, it's a preprint. It's a print. Oh, it's, it, it's kitties, I think. But it's the fabric. It's, yeah. Not sewn on. <laughs> uh, then, then there in 1898 to 1901 was the Spanish-American War. Now, at that time, Spain ruled Cuba. Cuba had the wonderful, the wonderful uh, legacy of having been owned by first this one and then that one and then somebody else. And in this time, they, they were owned, they were run by the Spaniards. And they had sent over to command them somebody that they called the butcher. And so you know that that was not a very good commander. And so sometimes we would go down and we would try to be helpful. In the early 1888, we sent a ship down called the Maine. Uh -huh. And, and uh, in February, they sank it. The Spaniards sank it. So... In February, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy was Teddy Roosevelt, and he, would ca he cabled the commander of Dewey with a plan to attack not Cuba, but the Philippines, which Spain also owed, owned, or claimed, I should say. And he said, if we go to war and the president gives the word, want you to attack, I want you to attack the Philippines. And he was so intrigued by this contest that he resigned as Secretary of the Navy so that he could participate down in Cuba. And I don't remember the saying, but I used to, I used to hear a saying all the time uh, that he had. You can, I, and there used to be a cartoon where he's on a hill and he's standing like this, and I don't remember the saying. Do you remember it, Penny? He was one of the Rough Riders, that's right, thank you, yeah. He was one of the Rough Riders. What's that? He led the Rough Riders, led the Rough Riders. that's right, he did. But, okay, so anyway, um, McKinley approved the war with Spain. Spain declared war on the U.S. On April 25th, the U.S. declared war on Spain. So these all have to do with that contest. That's the Spanish fleet. That's called the Spanish fleet. This is called Manila Bay. No, this is called Manila Bay. And this one is called... Dewey's, oh, this one's called Dewey's Victory, and this one's called Manila Bay. And it took them, and, and what they did, of course, they weren't expecting that at all. They expected a contest in Cuba, but they didn't expect anything to happen in the Philippines. So what happened is they went through one of the lesser used channels about six in the morning, and by noon, there was surrender. That's how long it lasted over in the Philippines. But it lasted longer in Cuba. Um, so the troops captured Manila. The Treaty of Paris was signed December 1898. And at that time, we annexed Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Now, Philippi the Phil Filipinos wanted to be independent, so it wasn't too long after that before the Philippines became independent. And the Puerto Ricans were given citizenship in 1917. This is the first time since the Civil War 
that the North and the South fought together a common enemy is the first time. And it was the beginning of the modern U.S. Army. It was their first major engagement of war. And it was the establishment of the, it was establishment of the American colonies overseas. Then I have, then I have in 1927, this one. This is called the Lindy Quilt. And this, of course, represents Lindbergh on his flight across the ocean in 1927. The original pattern calls for just the plane in green and just the eagles all in gold. But I kind of mixed it up a little bit. Um, I got so carried away with this. I was having such fun doing this one. I like the asymmetrical eagle. I, that's an interesting eagle. Uh, Charles Lindbergh did his solo flight May 20th, 21st, 1927. He became a folk hero on both sides of the Atlantic and a well-known figure in most of the world. He married Anne Morrow, daughter of the U.S. Ambassador in 1929. Uh, he, she would serve as a co-pilot navigator for him on many flights. And the Medal of Honor was awarded by a special act of Congress in 1927. Now, after the 1920, when, by the time we get to 1930, things are changing and people aren't creating as many quilt patterns as they used to. And the style of quilting starts to change. And then remember, this recession comes along, pretty, and they had utilitarian quilts. They didn't have time to create. But what I thought was interesting was quilters, they may not have had training but they were artists. They figured out where to put something. I have a what they call a postage stamp quilt. They're all little pieces like that. But where she put this one and where she put that one and where she put this one, it was an artistic endeavor. So it was their way of being creative and still making something useful. And I thought that was great. Then, of course, along came the war, the war effort and not so many more quilting for a while. And when they came back, like, mm, I'd say probably about in the 70s, in 1970, maybe a little bit earlier than that, uh, quilters began to look at quilt patterns in a different way. And they'd say, well, I, that's a nice quilt pattern, but I don't want to, you know, just copy it. I want to do something a little different with it. So they might take something like a flying goose, and they would do this with it. These are all flying geese. And so we begin, we, begin, we begin an era of having artists, art quilt. Up until this time, you would go to a quilt show or you would see it in a museum. And now we're beginning to treat quilts as art, as a form of art. So it's a whole different aspect. I'm getting away from my history, aren't I? Okay, but so now they would take they would take a pattern and they would change it enough to make it more artistic and do something different with it. They might stretch it, they might put it in half or something. Um, and what you see today, what you see today is they might take just a concept. This is four pieces of fabric. I don't. This is four pieces of fabric. Cut it a certain specific way, switch it around, cut it again, put it back together. So that's a concept as opposed to a pattern. And this is the very same technique, a different one. Same technique. Different four fabrics. Cut it a specific way, turn it around, cut it again, put it back together. So these are the things that are going on today. And also, art, quilters became artists. Now artists are becoming quilters. And it's, the whole field is sort of together. Yeah. Um, I have no more on the history uh, uh, that, 
I'm sure there must be some more patterns that relate to American history. There are a lot of like George Washington, Martha Washington, you know, uh, those kinds of things. But I, I just felt like the events in history were an interesting subject and it kind of helped me review American history. It's helped me remember uh, when what happened. And I hope it's helped you remember what happened. If there's anything you'd like to see further, please do. Um, questions? Penny. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I did. Okay. Oh, no, I have not thought about doing Butterfield. She's talking about it at college, yes. That was quite an undertaking. Um, I took the buildings on campus and I put them in fabric. Yeah. <laughs> No, I've not thought of doing Butterfield. I found out, I learned, learned new techniques to do that. Yes, it was pretty. I should take a look at that. I have, no, I've not thought of doing it. Someone, someone did that for ben the Bentonville Square. Oh, a group of ladies did it. And they did it as, as a triptych. You know, and each lady, like, the sky might be one color here, but it might be another color there. Oh, their work was great. Just great. You probably saw it, didn't you, Anne? I don't remember who did that. But yes, thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, I've had a good time sharing this with you. I was going to, um, I was asking Ricky if she'd like to put this in the display case, and she said, no, no, I want you to do the talk on it. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Um, because I'm about ready to make these as table runners or bed quilts and give them away. Uh, there's some good table toppers here, some good table runners here. Yeah. So thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Hope you've had a good time. I've had a good time. So if I've misrepresented any facts, please let me know so that I get them straight. <laughs>